Hello fellow nerds Today is going to be a special video A filler episode, if you will, to my Player's Handbook series Today we are returning to Volo's Guide to Monsters and learn more about specific monster lore and I have picked for you the Hex, the Dark Sisterhood. Hex are crones who represent corruption of ideals and goals, and they delight in seeing the innocent and good brought low. They are inhuman monsters, their forms twisted by evil shape changes and blasphemers. They ally with other hacks to form magical covens with extra powers. They collect and remember secret knowledge that is better lost and forgotten. Desperate mortals come to them looking for advice, only to have their requests fulfilled in ways that bring great suffering to themselves and their loved ones. Hags are mysterious, unfathomable and dangerous, especially from the viewpoint of mortals. One day a hag might be stealing and eating children that wander into the woods. On another day, she might be making lewd jokes to adventurers asking her for advice. And the next, she might be uprooting saplings to make a fence around her home for impaling intruders. It is nearly impossible to predict how a hag will act from day to day. Sometimes, moment to moment. Which is why folk with any wisdom at all give hags a wide berth. Hags perceive ugliness as beauty and vice versa. They revel in having a hideous appearance and sometimes go out of their way to improve upon it by picking at sores, wearing skins and bones as decoration and rubbing refu refuse and dirt into their hair and clothing. Because both the sealy cord and the unseely cord appreciate and revere true beauty among the fae, hags are almost never found in either place. The Summer Queen and the Queen of Air and Darkness recognize that hags have valuable knowledge and impressive magic, but they can't abide the stain on the beauty of their surroundings, so most hags are excluded from both courts. The rare few accepted as courtiers are either so influential that their entry can't be refused, or young and humble enough to be willing to use magic to put on a prettier appearance. Other hags aren't upset by their exclusion. They like to be left alone to their own sheens, not constrained by a fake queen's whims, and to be able to talk out of both sides of their mouth. Hags are virtually immortal, with a lifespan greater than that of even dragon and elves. The oldest, wisest and most powerful hags are called grandmothers by other hags. Some grandmothers are nearly as powerful as some of the archfey. Hags of lower but still respectable status are called aunties. An auntie gains her status from being very old, a member of a powerful coven directly serving a grandmother or having many offspring, whether adopted or birthed. Hags delight in corrupting others. They do so not by imposing, imposing their will or being outwardly violent, but 
not by making sinister bargains with those who seek their aid. This desire to orchestrate the downfall of others is why so many hacks make their homes near humanoid settlements, which give them a ready supply of creatures to tantalize and torment. Folk with nowhere else to turn are some of a hack's best customers. A farmer with a philandering spouse might seek out the local hack for a potion to make the spouse faithful again. The mayor with a demented father might ask the hag for something that makes him lucid again. A merchant whose child is deathly ill might go to the hag for a cure. The common element in these situations is that the mortals approach the hag for help, despite knowing that she is evil and dangerous. They are desperate enough to risk making a bargain with her or foolish enough to to think, to think they can persuade her to be helpful without getting something in return. Hags make bargains differently from how devils operate. A devil might approach a mortal to make a deal because it wants the individual to become tainted with evil so that when the victim dies, its soul goes to the nine hells. Hags are usually content to wait and conduct their own business, allowing mortals to come to them when the perceived need is great enough. Instead of being interested in a mortal's soul, a hag wants to bring the mortal low during its life as compensation for fulfilling her end of the bargain. Devils barter with the soul as the commodity. Hags barter because they enjoy making people miserable. Night hags, as fae turn fiends, use aspects of both methods, corrupting a mortal's dreams until the creature commits enough evil acts that she can claim its soul. As much as she enjoys offering and enforcing her bargain, a hag rarely goes out looking for people to make deals with because she knows that someone coming to her puts her in a position of power. The visitor likely had to approach the hag in secret for fear of causing an uproar in town and is probably eager to return home before being missed which adds time pressure to the process and tips the balance more in the hag's favor. All these factors contribute to the hag's being able to set her terms for the bargain, presenting an offer that appears reasonable, and perhaps seems to have a tempting loophole or two that the mortal could exploit. Hacks understand mortal desires and vices, and know how to manipulate people by preying on those qualities. A hacks bargain might bring success and prosperity for a time, but eventually have a drawback or side effect that makes the mortal resent the agreement and seek to get out of it. The philandering spouse, now happy to stay home, might grow slothful. The mayor's father might turn violent after regaining his senses, and the merchant's child might relapse if not treated again every few months. Even when a bargain turns sour for a mortal and other people in town hear about it or see the person's misfortune, the heck will eventually attract new customers. Other people will come to believe that they can outsmart the hag, or that their need is simple and can't be perverted, or that the earlier victims got too greedy when they were proposing a deal. Even if only one or two people make deals with a hag every year, over time, many unfortunates can come under her sway, and she remembers the exact terms of every one of those bargains.
Although it could be argued that there, there's no good time to make a bargain with a hag, mortals are more likely to get away in good shape if they offer up something a hag needs or wants. In such a case, the hag might even start the bidding. A hag that faces a serious threat from enemies will not hesitate to use promises or bribes to defuse this situation. For instance, most treasures in a hag's lair are useless without her knowledge of how to identify and handle them. So she might offer to provide such information in return for her life. If an item later backfires on the one who uses it, or turns out to be cursed in some way, that's just another lesson in why never in why never to threaten or trust a hack. There's a typo in the book, a double word. Hacks are curious about other creatures of power. They enjoy receiving news and gossip about other hags and influential creatures such as dragons, demons, genies, and certain mortals. Offering a hag accurate information of the sort as part of a bargain earns a small measure of her respect and might make her more receptive to the idea of a fair deal. When a hag bargains with other creatures of the Feywild rather than mortals, she approaches the situation with a more respectful attitude. She realizes that the creatures of her native realm are more powerful than common humanoids, and therefore more dangerous when disappointed or angered by a deal gone bad. Fey are also long-lived and thus have more time to retaliate against the hag, whereas most humanoids die within a few short decades. These considerations don't mean that hags are automatically pleasant in dealings with other Fey, just that they aren't as blatant or demanding in the bargains they offer. Hags know exactly how much they can get away with, and they like pushing the limits of what others will tolerate. When a hag is generous with her help or requires only a simple task as payment, that's no guarantee that the deal will turn out as expected for both parties. By offering a proposal that seems or actually is fair, chances are that the hag is pursuing a hidden agenda. She still wants to set events into motion that benefit her or bring about the downfall of another. But she does so in an indirect way that has no obvious connection to her. A bargain as simple as a villager agreeing to deliver a mysterious letter at a crossroads at noon on a certain day could be the key to ruining a mortal's life. The hag's reasons might not become apparent for years or even decades, or won't be meaningful except under specific circumstances, such as an auspicious birth or a climactic encounter with a dangerous villain. Even when she's offering a deal that seems to have no downside, a hag is always secretive about her motivations. The reasons for the for the payments she requires, or how these things benefit her. A hag that spends a long time in close proximity to a human settlement often depletes the community of good-hearted folk as they succumb to her evil and selfish plans. The mood of the town becomes unwelcoming, grim, moody, or outright hostile towards newcomers and travelers. Even after the hag has done her worst in such a place, she maintains leverage over her victims by holding out the prospect that someday she will undo the curses that she has laid on them. For that reason, 
the local leaders won't allow any outsiders to act against her, which includes sabotaging adventurers who might decide to confront her. Even when a hag acts dif indifferently or friendly towards adventurers, inside she is still a twisted fake creature, and she doesn't give two coppers about what anyone else thinks or wants. She might casually comment about how easily a visitor would fit in her cauldron, or make a blunt sexual comment about a guest. When a mortal visits a hag, the experience should be nerve-wracking, uncomfortable and risky. At any point, the hag might lose her temper and decide to pull out someone's fingernails with her iron teeth. Hags look upon younger creatures from a perspective of a cantankerous grandparent who no longer cares what anyone thinks. Set in her ways, free to speak her mind and not afraid to bring down punishment if pushed too far. Hags enjoy meddling with other people's lives, like busybodies with cruel intentions. Any time a hag agrees to help someone, the bargain includes a price to be paid, plus a hidden plan by which she sets the mortal up to fail, or a way that she gains leverage. When a hag is presented with an unusual spell, a rare magic item, or a person who has a strange magical gift, she will sniff it, shake it, listen to it, taste it, murmur odd statements to herself and mentally place a value on the merchandise. Hags aren't subtle about showing their intent at such times, and one might snatch away the offering so she can examine it more closely, even if this makes it obvious she is interested. If she doesn't have anything else like it or can think of a use for it, or if having it means a rival can't get her hands on it, she'll value the offering highly. A visitor who offers a desirable item as a bribe or gift is more likely to get a fair deal from the hag, or at least likely to suffer less when the true price of the deal is revealed. If a hag's life is threatened, she will pretend to be weak and helpless if she thinks it will spare her life or buy her time to retaliate or escape. She'll use dangerous treasures as bribes, not telling about their curses or side effects. She will lie and deceive and try to turn her enemies against each other, playing up their guilt and fear and jealousy to tear them apart from the inside. She is older, smarter, and more shrewd than any mortal who dares to threaten her. Hags prefer to cajole and bargain rather than confront someone with actual violence. They reserve their aggressive outbursts for situations where they are overwhelmingly more powerful than, they are, than their opponents, such as when attacking children or have an unfair advantage, such as when their enemy is asleep. Although a hag can always resort to attacking with her claws, if it comes to that, then something has gone very wrong with her plans. Over the course of a seemingly endless lifetime, a hag typically discovers or creates several unusual ways to use magic. The weird magic that hags can call upon comes in a number of forms and with various means of activation. Even those who have read scholarly books about hag law can't predict what a particular hag might have up her sleeve. A grandmother or some other hag of great age and renown might know unique rituals that can temporarily or permanently alter or transform a creature, bring, bre bring back the dead for a limited time, rewrite memories, or siphon emotions. 
At the other end of the spectrum, even a hack without lofty status is likely to have strange single-use items that don't emulate common spells or even follow the normal rules of magic. For inspiration in devising the effects of such weird items, see charms in chapter 7 of the Dungeon Master's Guide. If you want a hack to use a weird object of this sort in a combat situation, provide her with an item that produces a CR-appropriate spell effect when the hack manipulates or activates it. The effect might be a benefit to herself or an attack against her enemies. For example, a green hack might smash one A green hack might smash an ornate hand mirror, producing a cloud of glass shards that damages creatures like Cloud of Deckers. She might instead uncork a bottle of wasps that surround her and stitch up her wounds with her stingers, healing her as cure wounds would. Or she could take a mummified toad from her pocket and throw it into her cauldron, which immediately spews out inky blackness equivalent to darkness. A hack carefully shepherds her use of weird magic, because the items in her repertoire are often impossible to duplicate or replace. To reflect this fact, a hack should be able to use weird magic only once or twice per encounter in her lair or only once per encounter if she is elsewhere. A hack who is expecting a fight might be better prepared and able to use weird magic one additional time per encounter. If a hack is faced with mortal peril, all thoughts of conserving her resources vanish. She will use any weird magic at her disposal if it helps her stay alive. After all, a hack that's not dead has a virtually limitless lifetime to replace what was spent. No matter how hard it was to acquire that jar of death slugs, or that book on how to invoke the razor wind, or the runestone containing the three syllables for crystallizing blood, it is better to use such things than to risk death by not doing so. Many stories tell of hags using strange, enchanted creatures and objects for travel. And almost and most of those stories are accurate. Instead of the usual horse or pony, a hag might ride astride a giant pig, a goat or a cow. It's not unknown for a hag to use a sentient creature as a mount, perhaps as the result of a bargain that creature struck with her. A hack that wants to humiliate a mortal hero might require that hero to serve her, to serve as her mount for a year as part of fulfilling her bargain. The giant raven that carries a hack aloft could be, in actuality, one of the hag's victims transformed because that individual tried to go back on its deal. Some hacks prefer non-living conveyances from time to time, and their imagination in this regard knows no bounds. A hack might happily animate and spruce up any sort of object she can tailor for the purpose, such as a clay statue, a huge woven basket, a cauldron, a butter churn, a giant bird's nest, a mortar and pestle, or a tombstone. Usually only the hag that obtained or created them can use her mounts and vehicles. They obey only her commands and their magic responds only to her will. If a hag allows any other creature to use one of them as part of a bargain, she must be expecting an immense return on her investment. Now we are moving on to different types of hack.
hacks. Each of the five common types of hacks prefers a particular environment. It is possible to find a hack in unusual terrain, perhaps if she is traveling or is part of a coven along with two local hacks. Grandmothers and aunties are more likely than other hacks to take up permanent residence in unfriendly terrain, since their long-range plans sometimes require spending decades or years in a certain area before returning home. Ennis hags live in mountains or hills. The terrain is easy for them to navigate because they are the most physically capable hags. Even with her hunched posture, an Ennis hag is as tall as an ogre. Her skin is bruise blue or black and her claws are like rusty blades. Anna's hags love tormenting the weak and fearful and seeing others feel fear. Burr hags live in wintry lands favoring snow-covered mountain peaks. They are gaunt, have blue-white skin, white hair and are known for their grey wooden staffs that give them access to extraordinary ice magic. Burr hags love seeing mortars freeze to death and have little if any room in their hearts for kin and community. Green hags inhabit dismal forests, swamps and moors. A green hag's body, whether broad, narrow, fat or thin, is topped with a tangled mane of hair. A green hag thrives on creating despair and tragedy in the lives of her victims, using her skill with illusion magic to help in this goal. Destroying the hopes of others brings her unbridled joy. Night hags have left behind the world of the Fae to roam the lower plains. They have dark blue or purple-black skin with white or light colored eyes and thin curving horns. A night hag is at least as tall as a human, and most are stout or have a medium build rather than being thin or m- Night hags enjoy corrupting the dreams of good people, compromising the ideals of their victims to get them to eventually perform evil acts. Then, when a victim dies, the hag can harvest its soul and bring it to Hades. Sea hags live under water or on the shore, favoring bleak and despoiled places. They have pale skin like that of a fish covered in scales with glassy dead eyes and hair like lank seaweed. Sea hags Sea hags are emaciated, but one might be tall or short, frail or large boned. A sea hag hates beauty in any form and seeks to attack, deface or corrupt it, so it has the opposite effect on its viewers. One is more likely to defile the inspiring statue in a town square making it into a symbol of fear and sorrow than to destroy it outright. Hags are selfish by nature, and each one cherishes her independence from the rest of the world as well as from other hags. At the same time, every hag recognizes that she and her sisters are kindred souls like the members of a dark sorority or sisterhood. Even though hags don't like each other, they share knowledge and trade secrets, helping them to keep abreast of worldly events and possible dangers. Even a hag living in a remote, isolated location is aware of goings-on that involve her neighboring hags, whether through magical communication, personal visits, or mundane messengers such as birds. 
In most cases, these relationships with her sisters, though devoid of emotion, are the closest a hag comes to having friends. When a hag is attacked or killed, other hags are likely to hear about it. If the victim was friendly with other hags, those responsible for her death might find themselves the target of retaliation. If the victim died while owing favors to another hag, that hag sees her killers as now responsible for the dead hag's deaths. If the victim was unpopular or if other hags were indebted to her, her killers might receive relatively cordial treatment from those other hags instead. Every hag has a particular status relative to others of her kind, and to hags of all sorts, based on age, abilities, influence, alliances, and experience, and is aware of her place, though not necessarily satisfied with it. The few grandmothers mothers sit at the top of the hierarchy. A larger number of aunties are beneath that, and all other hags vie for prominence in a chaotic pecking order that no mortal can truly figure out. A hag that is known to associate with an auntie has a higher status than a similarly powerful hag without such a connection. And the young hag, born of a grandmother, begins her existence already benefiting from a greater measure of respect and status. To a hag, the thought of sharing her home with other creatures, even other hags, is disgusting. No, that's very relatable, isn't it? She has nothing but dislike or disdain for anyone other than herself, and she loves being alone, except for the company of minions and other creatures under her sway. That's the ordinary state of affairs, but when a group of hags have a common goal or they seek greater power to combat a formidable threat, they suppress their basic nature and come together to do their work. The result is a coven. Being part of a coven gives each individual hag more magic and spellcasting ability and to her these benefits offset the inconvenience and bickering that goes with living and working with other hags. If a member of a coven is killed and the surviving members intend to keep the group from dissolving, they immediately attempt to recruit a replacement. This process involves each prospective member committing cruel acts with the aim of impressing the remaining coven members. Adventurers who slay only one member of a coven might deal a blow to it in the short term. But later, on the surrounding regions wrecked with plagues, curses and other disasters, as the applicants attempt to outdo one another. An unusually gifted mortal sorcerer, warlock or wizard of a deeply evil nature might be invited to join a coven or allowed to compete for a vacancy. This arrangement is potentially a dangerous proposition for the mortal, but a pair of hags might agree to it if their needs are served. For instance, a human member of a coven makes an ideal spy and infiltrator in and around humanoid settlements. make more hags by snatching and devouring human infants, birthing daughters who turn into hags on entering the thirteenth year of their lives. Fortunately for humanity and the rest of the world, such an occurrence is rare. Rarer still, but not unheard of, is for a hag to repeat this process twice or more in short succession, 
giving her multiple offspring of about the same age. She might do this to form a coven with two of her daughters, or to create a coven made up entirely of her offspring. Some hacks cite ancient law that suggests that if a hack consumes twins or triplets, her offspring might have additional, unusual abilities. Similarly, devouring the seventh-born child of a seventh-born is said to be a way to pass on rare magic to the hag's daughter. Some covens gather for a specific purpose, such as to defeat a champion of good, to serve as oracles for the delivery of baleful prophecies, or to corrupt a pristine wilderness. In such a case, because the coven strives to bend its magic to a more directed purpose, the members have different spells available to use with their shared spellcasting trait, usually focusing on a theme related to that purpose. Three examples of themed hag coven spells are given below. Death. For a coven whose members are obsessed with death and the ability to manipulate it, an appropriate spell list would be first level with four slots, false life and inflict wounds, second level with three slots, Gentle Repose and Ray of Enfeeblement. Third level with three slots. Animate Dead, Revivify and Speak with Dead. Fourth level, three slots. Blight and Death Ward. Fifth level with two slots. Contagion and raise dead. Sixth level with one slot, circle of death. Nature. Hags might seek to exert control over the environment and the creatures in it by mastering the following group of spells. First level with four slots. Entangle and speak with animals. Second level with three slots. Flaming Sphere, Moonbeam, and Spike Growth. Third level with three slots, Cool Lightning and Plant Growth. Fourth level, three slots, Dominate Beast and Grasping Vine. Fifth level with two slots, Insect Plague and Tree Stride. And six level with one slot, Wall of Thorns. Prophecy The power to affect the future or perceive things out of the norm could make these spells attractive to a coven. First level with four slots, Bane and Bless. Second level with th three slots, Augury and Detect Thoughts. Third level with three slots. Clairvoyance, Dispel Magic and Non-Detection. Fourth level, three slots. Arcane Eye and Locate Creature. Fifth level, two slots. Gears and Legend Lore. And sixth level with one slot, true seeing. Let's continue with the hag layers. No matter what form it takes, a hag's home is a manifestation of her basic nature. It is ugly, eerie or unnerving in some way often incorporating some aspect of decay, such as a dead tree, 
a ruined tower or a menacing cave entrance that resembles a skull. Whether naturally or by manufactured means, the lair is well defended from intrusion. It might be reachable only by a steep mountain path, or it might be surrounded by a fence the hag builds out of posts capped with magically watered skulls. Often the lair reflects the outlook of its primary inhabitant. A murderous hag's home might be crafted to look like a coffin or a mausoleum, and that the forgottenness one might look like a tavern or a gingerbread house. Because such places are convenient for them, sea hags often establish their lairs inside the hulls of wrecked or abandoned ships. Many hags settle in places where the barriers between the mortal world and the Feywild are thin, making it easy for them to interact and bargain with creatures of both realms. Other popular choices are a place where the ambient energy augments certain kinds of magic, a site related to death such as a burial ground, and within the ring of fallen standing stones that still resonate with ancient power. In order to facilitate bargaining with mortals, the home must be near enough to a populated area that it attracts occasional visitors but not so close that a community would see the hex presence as a threat and try to defeat her or drive her off. A hex home is cluttered with mundane items, caged creatures, oddities, objects that hint of a magical purpose, preserved specimens, scraps of lore and curiosities that have a supernatural origin but aren't inherently magical. For a selection of strange hack treasures, see the one-of-a-kind object section later in this chapter. A hack always has an escape plan in case ambitious do-gooders try to turn her home into her final resting place. If she is outmatched or wants to vacate her lair quickly for some other reason, she uses a mix of her inner spell casting, rare magic, guile and the assistance of minions to get away. Most hacks have three plans prepared. One for general threats and two others for specific likely scenarios such as they, they've set the house on fire or the necromancer with undead are attacking. If a hag is forced to resort to such measures, she immediately begins to plot her retaliation against those that caused her to flee. Like a vampire or a demon, a hag has a long life over which to, an to exact her vengeance, and no dish of revenge is sweeter than one served cold and to the next three generations of her enemy's family. If a hag is a grandmother, she gains a set of lair actions appropriate to her nature, knowledge and history. A coven that includes a grandmother can use her lair actions as well, but the grandmother's will prevails. If one of the coven attempts this sort of action and the grandmother disapproves, nothing happens. A powerful auntie or her coven might also have access to lay actions like these, but only at certain times of the year or when the influence of the Feywild is strong. The following lay actions are options for grandmothers and powerful aunties. Grandmothers usually have three to five lair actions. Aunties usually only one, if they have any at all. Unless otherwise noted, any lair action that requires a creature to make a saving throw uses the save DC of the hag's most powerful ability. 
Now let's have a look at these layer actions. On initiative count 20, losing initiative ties, the hack can take a layer action to cause one of the following effects, but can't use the same effect two rounds in a row. Until initiative count 20 on the next round, the hack can pass through solid walls, doors, ceilings, and floors as if the surfaces weren't there. The hack targets any number of doors and windows that she can see, causing each one to either open or close as she wishes. Closed doors can be magically locked requiring a successful DC-20 strength check to force open. Until she chooses to make them unlocked or until she uses this lay action again to open them. A powerful NS hack might have the following additional layer action. The hack creates a thick cloud of caustic black smoke that fills a 20-foot radius sphere centered on a point she can see within 120 feet. The cloud lasts until initiative count 20 on the next round. Creatures and objects in or behind the smoke are heavily obscured. A creature that enters the cloud for the first time on a turn or starts its turn there, takes 10 or 3d6 acid damage. A powerful burr hack might have the following additional layer action. The hack creates a blizzard in a 40 foot high, 20 foot radius cylinder centered on a point she can see within 120 feet of her. The effect lasts until initiative count 20 on the next round. The blizzard lightly obscures every creature and object in the area for the duration. A creature that enters the blizzard for the first time on a turn or starts a turn there is blinded until initiative count 20 on the next round. A powerful green hag might have the following additional layer action. The green hag creates an illusory duplicate of herself, which appears in its own space. As long as she can see her duplicate, the hag can move it a distance equal to her walking speed as well as make the illusion speak on her turn. No action required. The illusion has the same statistics as the hag but can't take actions or reactions. It can interact with its environment and even pick up and hold real objects. The illusion seems real in every way but disappears if it takes any amount of damage. Otherwise, it lasts until the hack dismisses it, no action required, or can no longer see it. If the hack uses this layer action to create a new duplicate, the previous one vanishes, dropping any real objects in its possession. A powerful night hack might have the following additional layer action. One creature the hack can see within 120 feet of her must succeed on a DC 15 charisma saving throw or be banished to a prison demiplane. To escape, the, to escape, the creature must use its action to make a charisma check contested by the hacks. If the creature wins, it escapes the demiplane. Otherwise, the effect ends on initiative count 20 on the next round. When the effect ends, the creature reappears in the space it left or in the nearest unoccupied space if that one is occupied. And the second option for the night hack is the hack targets up to three creatures that she can see within 60 feet of her. 
Each target must succeed on a DC 15 constitution saving throw or be flung up to 30 feet through the air. A creature that strikes a solid object or is released in mid-air takes 1d6 bludgeoning damage for every 10 feet moved or fallen. A powerful sea hag might have the following additional layer actions. And these are again two options. The hag fills up to four 10-foot cubes of water with ink. The inky areas are heavily obscured for one minute, although a steady, strong underwater current disperses the ink on initiative count 10. The hag ignores the obscuring effect of the ink. The hag chooses a humanoid within the lair and instantly creates a simulacrum of that creature, as if created with a simulacrum spell. This hideous simulacrum is formed of seaweed, slime, half-eaten fish and other garbage but still generally resembles the creature it is imitating. It obeys the hag's commands and is destroyed on initiative count 20 on the next round. Now let's look at the regional effects. A hag's foul nature slowly suffuses the environment around her lair, twisting it to evil. Each hag's lair is a source of three to five regional effects. The home of a grandmother, an auntie or a coven has more effects than the lair of a single hag, including some that can directly harm intruders. Any regional effect that requires a creature to make a saving throw uses the safety sea of the hag's most powerful ability. These effects either end immediately if the hag dies or abandons the lair or take up to 2d10 days to fade away. The region within one mile of a grandmother hag's lair is warped by the creature's fell magic, which creates one or more of the following effects. Birds, rodents, Snakes, spiders or toads are found in the great profusion. Beasts that have, that have an intelligence score of 2 or lower are charmed by the hag and directed to be aggressive toward intruders in the area. Strange carved figurines, twig fetishes or ragdolls magically appear in trees. Powerful Ennis Hag creates one or more of the following regional effects. The gravel stones on a safe looking path, road or trail occasionally become sharp for 100 foot intervals. Walking on these areas is like walking on caltrops. Small avalanches of rock intermittently fall blocking a path or burying intruders. A buried creature is restrained and has to hold its breath, its breath until it is dug out. Strange laughter, sounding like that of children or the hag herself, occasionally pierces the silence. Small cans appear along the route of travelers containing anything from mysterious bones to nothing at all. These might be haunted by skeletons, spectres or hostile fae. A powerful burr hag creates one or more of the following additional regional effects. Small avalanches of snow intermittently fall, blocking a path or burying intruders. Human-sized blocks of ice appear containing frozen corpses. These corpses might break free and attack as zombies, or their spirits might attack as specters. 
blizzards come without warning. A blizzard occurs once every 2d12 hours and lasts 1d3 hours. During a storm, creatures moving over land travel at half normal speed and normal visibility is reduced to 30 feet. Roads, paths and trails twist and turn back on themselves, making navigation in the area exceedingly difficult. A powerful green hag creates the following regional effects. Illusory duplicates of the hag appear in random places at random times. An illusory duplicate has no substance, but it looks, sounds and moves like the hag. The hag can sense when one or more creatures are within the 60 feet of, of her duplicate and can interact with them as if she were present and standing in the duplicate's base. If the illusory duplicate takes any damage, it disappears. The region takes twice as long as normal to traverse, since the plants grow thick and twisted, and the swarms are thick with reeking mud. Trees transform into awakened trees and attack when hostile intruders are near. Moving on to the Night Hag's regional effects. Shadows seem abnormally gaunt and sometimes move on their own as though alive. Creatures are transported to a harmless but eerie demiplane filled with shadowy forms waxy corpses and cackling. The creatures are trapped there for a minute or two and then return to the place where they vanished from. Intelligent creatures see hallucinations of dead friends, family members and even themselves littering the hex realm. Any attempt to interact with a hallucinatory image causes it to disappear. And lastly, the sea hag's regional effects. Most surfaces are covered by a thin film of slime which is slick and sticks to anything that touches it. Currents and tides are exceptionally strong and treacherous. Any ability check made to safely navigate or control a vessel moving through these waters has disadvantage. Shores are littered with dead, rotting fish. The hag can sense when one of the fish is handled and cause it to speak with her voice. Although they are solitary by nature, hags sometimes feel the need for companionship. Usually, one scratches this itch by acquiring servants she can insult and slap around as she wishes. Such a creature might be charmed into compliance or under a spell that stops its heart if it disobeys, or too afraid of non-magical punishment for failure to do what she says. Most hags have some kind of slave or minion creature living with or near them as a defense against attackers, even if it's just a common animal. Hags particularly delight in using mortals bound to their service as minions. A paladin might have no qualms about putting a hag coven to the sword, but her conviction falters if she must first fight through a crowd of innocent farmers that the hag has compelled to defend her. Ordinary folk are also useful as minions because they can serve the hag as their eyes and ears in a nearby settlement, either operating secretly or actively, trying to persuade other townsfolk to pay her a visit. The weird magic at a hag's disposal means that she might have almost any type of creature helping or serving her, fae, giant, undead so on. 
even a creature much more powerful than she might be under her command, working off the debt of a bargain for herself or someone else. Favors beget favors, and under duress, a hag might speak a magic word to call upon a blood debt from a dragon, a noble, or another hag, making her able to wield magic, political or physical power, in a way she can't do by herself. Like the land near a hag's lair, over time her minions are altered by her presence, becoming twisted versions of their former selves, but still recognizable as what they once were. She might alter them with magic, making them tireless, resistant to fire, able to transform into a flock of crows, or able to teleport through shadows. Whatever the hag thinks best defends or serves her. Now here is a table of random hag minions, which includes, for example, flame skulls, scarecrows, a rock of smothering. These are on the servant table. And then there's the brutes table for the dirty work which includes, for example, Kenku, Doppelgänger, Gargoyles, or Bugbears. And the chapter ends with a treasure table, which includes, for example, a small painting that depicts a placid field. Just after midnight each day the painting changes to depict the following day's weather. Or a seemingly mundane gold piece. Anyone who touches it gains the unshakable belief that this is the very first gold coin minted by humanity. Or the eye of a cleric preserved in a liquid-filled jar. When an undead creature comes within 100 feet of the jar, the eye darts about as if it is looking around in panic. It otherwise remains motionless. That's very creepy. I like it. I might use that for my campaign. Coming to speak of my campaign, my players recently met a hag and how do I put this? It went kind of well for them because I had the hag get bored and leave because no party at level Three should fight a night hag, but they are a bunch of murder hobos. Um, so I want to keep it fun. So sometimes I bend the rules a bit, the rules of role playing in this case, and just had the hag go meh. This is getting ridiculous. I'm out of here. But I fear I've been doing this quite a lot because my version of Strahd, who is not called Strahd in my campaign, um, kind of did the same thing, even though that's uh, in character for him. Anyway, maybe they need to learn their lesson because apparently the paladin failing on two death saves wasn't lesson enough 
what the heck? I have to think about this. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this monster lore video. I sure did. I really like these fleshed out monsters with a lot of background information and role playing tips, even with treasure tables and stuff. I know they can't do this for the mon for the monster manual, but um, Volo's guide is really really nice. I strongly recommend you have a look at it. It has nice artwork too. I mean, everything in D and D has nice artwork, but this is really really nice. So, thank you very much for spending your time with me. I am very much looking forward to our next meeting. And until then, bye bye.